Yeah, good day and welcome back to episode two of my trilogy on do all bandsaw gearbox repair. I've already got all the parts out of the gearbox. And before I can install these beautiful new gears which Luke sent me, I need to finish the output shaft. Right now the features I still need to work on here. The easy one is just this, just the oiling hole there. I'm not going to put that groove in there. I don't think that's necessary. It's a pressure fed lubrication system. So the oil will work its own way out along the clearance. This is the bandsaw wheel drive. Now you can see they use this kind of funky double woodruff key. Maybe it's necessary for the loads at the maximum capacity of this machine, but I'll never take it out there. With my temporary shaft, I used a quarter inch key, just a standard one, and that was easy, it worked. I'll use that again. Now these key slots were for 606 size Imperial Woodruff keys, which of course I don't have the cutter for. I don't have the key either, I'll have to make that. But I do have this slot cutter, which I think is probably for T-slots. It cuts five millimeters wide. So I think I'll just touch it up on the Clarkson, take it down 0.2 of a millimeter, and then use that. A bit of side relief. Doesn't take much. I'll set up a finger to index off. Might not be the right place. Or the right style. Flick that around. This looks like it's also a shop made tool. Okay, that ain't coming out. Not sure they, why they put a set screw in it. Wait a minute, that needs to move with this. That means I need this one, which mounts on top. Right, welcome to the Clarkson. Half an hour setup, 10 seconds grinding. That may be enough. I'll just take it out and check. The aim is to have the cutter four points, cutting a 4.7 slot. Now that's looking pretty good. Things generally cut slightly oversized. So I'll do a test cut. Hmm, not supposed to get that error. So something in the e-stop chain isn't closed. Okay, this one. Okay, what about the one on the pendant? The table's about in the middle of travel, so it can't be on the x-axis end stop. The y-axis is a good seven or eight centimeters out from its end stop. And the z-axis also looks to be in about the middle of its travel. That means I need to get in behind the machine and open up the control cabinet. But the control cabinet door is about a meter wide and it's only sitting a third of a meter from the wall. So I need to move the machine forward. As always, the pallet jack is under the wrong machine. I enjoyed making my welding cart so much, I was going to make some wheelie thing for the Clarkson. That would be a real good idea. It's always in the way. Right, take the chance to get rid of all the spiders. Gross. Right, Mr. Machine. What are you trying to tell me? So, e-stop.
from pin 204 through to pin 264. That should be the pendant. Okay, it's working. Pin 204, 264. So the pendant he stops okay. Next, 264 to 265. I think these are the three like X, Y, and Z end stops. 264 to 265 is fine. The next is 265 to 267. So, so fine. 267 to 268. Also fine. Coming down here, the next one, the hydraulic pump. 268 to 269. That's fine. 7B1, 7B2, but I need 269 up to here onto the relay panel. 217. I guess it's this one. Hmm. Okay, now there it is. That means those two are fine. One thing I remember, when I first got this machine, I had an intermittent fault on this edge connector. These edge connectors maybe got corrosion in them or something, and I had an intermittent contact. I'll just try reseeding all of these. Maybe if I'm lucky, that's the problem. Seeing as a lot of my troubleshooting is based on hope, I'll just plug the machine in and see if it's changed anything. Alright, you fixed the problem. Well, I'm glad that went kind of well. Better an area you already know than a new one. Checking this with gauge blocks, found out it's cutting about 4.83, so 3 one hundredths oversize. Since I'm going to make the key, I'm not going to bother grinding the tool down anymore, I'll just make the key to fit.
need to take 0.19 off each side. I'm still slightly undersized. All right, now I'll do a bit of deburring so that Quinn doesn't think I'm an animal. Scarred there. Right, before I can start prepping for heat treatment, there's one more machining step I need to do, and that's that oil gallery there, which connects to the oil coming in through the shaft. When it comes to heat treatment, there's obviously a perfect way of doing it would be to find a vendor and have them nitride these parts. But unfortunately, here in Austria, it's very difficult to find commercial vendors who are willing to do sort of walk-in jobs. Uh, Andy Pugh did give me a link to a company in England that would do it, but the whole posting stuff out of the EU and then waiting for customs, and it's just a pain in the neck. What I'm gonna do is just heat treat these myself. I've got this green snot which I bought off eBay a few years ago. I don't know what it is, but it just prevents the oxides forming. I'm gonna coat the parts tonight, and then tomorrow it's heat treat time. To the pieces on a bit of wire, so that I can easily pull them out of the oven and dunk them in the um, hardening oil. Okay, well that stuff's now dried overnight. Maybe I wasn't supposed to leave it to dry because it looks like it's already caused some corrosion. Speaking of corrosion, one of my mates was involved with dropping a couple of GE90s off a part-out aircraft and it turned out that the inlet covers had been on this thing for probably a year or two and moisture got in behind them and corroded the lip skins. It reminds me of that time back in about 98 where one of our aircraft was taxiing in and stopped a little short of the parking position. Although the anti-collision lights were still on, a catering truck drove straight up to door two and at just that moment, the pilot released the brakes and taxied forward to his real parking position. The catering truck punched a hole in the inlet lip skin. Now, in aviation, when an airline borrows a part from another airline, the standard rate back then was to pay about 1% of the purchase price per day. And a GE90 inlet cowling cost about a million bucks back then. Anyway, after a couple of weeks, we'd received a replacement skin and the sheeties had installed it. So our inlet went back on wing and the loan unit was removed and boxed up, ready for shipping. Which isn't easy, because these things are enormous. Unfortunately, about three months later, that huge box was still sitting in our outgoing stores yard. Just give it a bit of a warm up at 100 degrees, in case we've still got some water in that coating. Boy, was that an expensive mistake. Three months sitting on a million dollar item was basically um, getting close to a million bucks in lease fees. Ouch. So what sort of oil do I need for hardening and how much of it? Well, glad you should ask. Now, according to the internet, you want about a gallon of oil per pound of steel mass. There was a really good video by the, I think he's called the knife making nerd. He did a bunch of tests and they showed that vegetable oil is pretty useless for water hardening steels you typically make use for knife making. But I'm not making a knife. He did show that vegetable oils work almost as well as heat treatment oil for oil hardening steels. And that's what I've got. So I nipped over to the supermarket and bought 7 litres of the cheapest, nastiest oil they had. Sunflower oil. The recommended heat treatment temperatures of the two steels I'm using intersect at 850 degrees Celsius. These steels both need about two hours to austenitize before you quench them. 
Now I think this bin is a bit too wide and shallow. Yeah, it is. So to make it deeper, I'll just displace the oil a bit. This is just full of water. Well, it's slowly heated up to 850. And the reason it went so slowly is you may have noticed I stood up the two shafts because ideally you want to reduce any bending stress on the shaft while it's being heat treated. Unfortunately, the one was very unstable. And I was thinking at the time, I hope it doesn't fall over and short circuit one of the heating coils. Sure enough, it did. The left hand coil is now dead. So it's only heating with the right coil, which in this case is probably an advantage because you want to heat it kind of quite slowly. But yeah, bummer. Face shield when I take it out, my high temperature gloves. File test. It's definitely harder. Okay, two hours of tempering at 450. Well, the good news is all three of them did harden. So what did I learn? Well, this green stuff to prevent oxidation is quite effective for some small quick part, like a tap made out of drill rod or silver steel, because you don't have to hold it at temperature for too long. It didn't work that well where I so had to heat soak these parts for two hours at high temperature and then another two hours for tempering. So that's a bit of a dis disappointment. The second thing I noticed, I should have used thicker wire to bind the parts. The wire was too thin, it broke, and then the things fell into my oil bath. Let's get this mill scale off and see what they look like once they're cleaned up a little. I'll fill this with three quarters water. It's easiest to remove mill scale with, with acid. In this case, it's hydrochloric acid, 25%. Just water this down. Always add acid to water. Once the parts come out of the acid bath, they will uh, flash rust really fast. So to neutralize the acid, I'll just make a solution of sodium hydroxide. This is just barbecue cleaner. I think this one's done. So here are the three pieces after cleanup. Well, what can I say? One, I needed to expect uh, pitting from such a heat treatment process. I didn't really plan for that. I thought that that green gunge would work better. Second, I should have left a final machining allowance on all of the bearing surfaces with the danger of them going undersize. Uh, the gear itself, it's looking okay. It's, uh, it's bore is still a nice fit on its matching shaft. So I'm not too worried about it. This shaft still needs to have the plain bearing journal here ground. So it doesn't really matter that it's pitted at the moment. That'll clean up. Uh, these two journals, I'm going to have to be careful to not take them down undersize. And I may end up needing a Loctite bearing retainer if I no longer have a proper press fit. We'll see once I clean those up. 
Yeah, this shaft, once again, this bearing journal, I'll have to be careful not to take it under size. And if, if I can't avoid it, it's gonna need Loctite bearing retention. These two both need to be cleaned up to a high polished finish because they're plain bearing journals. They're, they're probably not quite as critical from dimension. There were quite wide tolerances on those. I am gonna finish them and install them in the third part of this trilogy, see how they go. But when Luke machined them, he didn't make a single set, he made two. So if I do find I scrap, for example, this shaft by going undersize. Uh, Andy Pugh gave me a link to a nitrider in England I might be able to use. There is a heat treatment company about an hour north of where I live where I could also go and see if I could get these nitrided. If that's the case, I'll just be making a replacement output shaft as well. But first up, let's see if we can get these working. Yesterday I had a very interesting visit from an American, Doric, and a German guy called Kurt, and we talked about machining and clock making. We'd, there's a Patreon live stream up on that if you're interested. They very generously gave me this nice blank collet for the Schaublum. Thanks very much guys, it was a pleasure to meet you. The next thing to look at is whether the small shaft distorted and bent from the heat treatment. It's looked like it's now out of round. Now this surface definitely still needs machining back to a highly polished surface because it's the bearing. I'll try and remove that run out when I do that. Whereas this end is the input shaft carrying the input pulley and that's just a rubber belt drive. So I'm not too worried if there's a little run out here. And just for comparison, this is the run out on the original shaft. So as you can see, I've still got a bit of work to do on these shafts, but hey, that'll have to wait for next week. Thanks very much for watching, and please, if you enjoy this, share a link with someone who might also enjoy it.